so I've nerd sniped myself and it's a good one. And I thought, why don't we figure it out together? So I got this sprinkler toy for my kids and it reminded me of those wacky, waving, you know, dancing man things. And I suddenly had this question, is it the same mechanism? At first glance, they seem very similar, but on further inspection, I'm not so sure. So we're gonna find out how both things work. And spoiler alert, it's weird. Along the way, we're gonna to talk to some firefighters because it turns out that the wacky, waving, inflatable tube man mechanism can be deadly for firefighters, genuinely. And while we're there, we'll find out that most people believe something about firefighters that isn't true. The wacky, waving, inflatable tube man and the this garden toy are at least both examples of hose instability. This type of hose instability you see in a few different contexts. Even just a garden hose will do it if you have good enough pressure. And it's a behavior that firefighters have to be trained to deal with. The fluid doesn't have to be liquid, it can also be a gas. If I attach this flexible tube to my air compressor, then we get the same behavior. Here it is in slow motion. The fluid in these ones is also a gas, but to my mind, the behavior is quite different. Let's start by trying to explain the instability of this type. The air compressor setup is useful because I can experiment with it without getting just incredibly wet. Let's suppose we start with a straight hose, but then we introduce a small perturbation. Now inside that bend, the water is changing direction. On the way into the bend, it has momentum in this direction, and on the way out, it has momentum in this direction. That means it must have experienced a force. The direction of the force is easy to work out. It's just the difference between these two vectors. So we know the force is acting in this direction. I mean, look, I've made that more complicated than it needs to be. This is just something you know, right? Like uh, something curves to the left when it's pushed to the left. But of course we know that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So if the pipe is pushing on the water to cause it to change direction, then the water must be pushing on the pipe. And of course that's pretty obvious too. We can imagine the water slamming against the inside wall of the pipe. So if the water is feeling a force in this direction, the curved section of the hose must be feeling a force in this direction. And so this slight bend in the hose becomes larger as it's pushed outwards by the force of the water. Now from this point, if the hose is fairly short, then the motion becomes quite predictable. It oscillates from side to side, which makes sense because as more and more of the hose is pulled into motion by that force from the bend, well, eventually the end of the hose is moving. And you can see from the geometry of it that it's moving in such a way that it ends up pointing in the other direction. It flips over and now the curve in the hose is pointing the other way. And so the force on the hose flips direction as well. And so then the curve starts to grow in reverse. And then again, the end flips over and the cycle continues. In other words, there's one dominant curve and it flips from side to side. But if the hose is a bit longer, you can have the dominant curve at the front of the hose, but then secondary curves that are still important closer to the base. And those two curves are gonna influence each other and grow and shrink and flip at different rates. And so you end up with a chaotic system above a certain length of hose. It's a bit like how rivers become meandering. A slight bend in the river leads to erosion on the outside bank and so the curve becomes more pronounced. You can sometimes see a sped up version of that in a rivulet of water running down glass. And there's a similar thing going on when a flag flutters. I read in one paper that the neck of a balloon, when the air is let out, does the simple side to side motion as opposed to the chaotic motion. So it's like when we made the air hose short and it just waggled from side to side. But brilliantly, when I tested it, it actually looks more like a sky dancer. Just for fun, we could put a little bend in the end of this hose. That's cool, isn't it? It's not really the same kind of instability. And in fact, if the anchor point of the hose could swivel perfectly, then there would be no instability. It would just be a rotating garden sprinkler. Link in the card in the description to a video I made with Destin from Smarter Every Day on the somewhat related strange behavior of sprinklers that point inwards. If a firefighter loses control of the end of a hose, it will most likely flail about just like a garden hose does under high pressure. It's something that firefighters receive training on 
how to deal with when it happens. I'm Station Officer Joseph Haynes, currently at headquarters in Central Operation. When it did happen in the past, people would crawl down the line. Why would they do that? Why didn't they just turn it off? We don't have like right angle valves to turn off these because you've got a tremendous weight of water moving at quite a rate. So just like your taps at home, we have, we have to sort of rotate a, a valve. The time that it would take, yeah. it's not very long, but then the difficulty is you would have all of the stored pressure in that hose to still be whipping around for a few seconds. This is roughly how long it's going to be carrying on for. So it's only going to be a few seconds before that hose is safe. There is the option of the emergency stop there, which will kill the pump completely. But if I'm supplying multiple jets, that's not an option. Actually, all of this got me thinking about something we're often taught in school, and you'll see it in textbooks, and you even see it in like lectures by smart people, but it's something that I now think is wrong. It's the question of how much force is required to hold a fire hose nozzle in place. In this textbook, for example, they use the very reasonable argument that the fire hose is like a rocket. Jet fuel is pushed out of the back of the rocket, and there is an equal and opposite force on the rocket that pushes it forwards. Apply that reasoning to the fire hose and we reach the conclusion that the firefighter must withstand the full reaction force of all that water. In other words, it's as if the hose is being pointed directly at the firefighter and they must resist being pushed backwards by it. When you're holding the hose, does it feel like you're bracing against that kind of force? Absolutely. I mean, water exiting the branch is pushing back, isn't it? It's Newton's third law, right? Well, is, Come yeah. on, Steve, you should be well, telling know, me this. I know, but this, is, this is what <laughs> Feel free to prove yeah. me wrong on your, uh, on your video. But yeah. Well, I kind of want to prove Joseph wrong, or at least try to prove him wrong. Because here's the thing, the water doesn't gain its momentum at the nozzle. It already had momentum in the hose. It gains its momentum from the pump. So it should be the pump that feels that reaction force, not the firefighter. And by my reasoning, if the fire hose is perfectly straight, then the firefighter wouldn't need to brace against any force at all. But as someone who's never put himself in physical danger in the pursuit of extinguishing a house fire, it would be arrogant of me to dismiss the experience of someone who has. So what's happening? Well, I think I found the answer in a couple of papers. This often cited paper by Chin claims that firefighters must resist the full force of the water to be able to hold the nozzle in place. But this paper challenges that reasoning. And it goes on to calculate the force that a firefighter would feel from the nozzle due to the curvature in the hose, in the same way that we see the end of this hose being pulled back by the increasing curvature here. Now, obviously, the way a hose ends up lying on the ground at the scene of a fire is going to vary a lot. But what's interesting is that for a hose with about 90 degrees worth of bends in it, you end up with a force on the nozzle that is of a similar order of magnitude to the naive rocket way of thinking about it. So the reason how a firefighter feels like he must brace against the full force of all that water leaving the nozzle is because, well, the force is about that size. Except interestingly, he's not being pushed back by the water, he's being pulled back by the hose that wants to snake and wiggle. Or at least that's what I thought. And then I actually measured the force on the end of the air hose. And it turns out that the force is the same whether the hose is straight or whether it has a full turn on it. There's no discernible difference in the force that the end of the hose feels pushing slash pulling backwards. So I definitely haven't proven Joseph wrong. I mean, maybe my reasoning was persuasive, but like if the experiments don't match up, then I mean, that's it. So I just, I, I don't know. I, it, like, it doesn't make sense to me uh, as it is. Um, maybe you can help. The fire brigade were very kind to let me come and film with them, but they did want you to know about something important in return. It's to do with these burnt out chunks of metal. We see a fire involving an e-bike or an e-scooter every other day in London. Three people lost their lives last year in e-bike and e-scooter related fires. If you have to charge it in your home, do it in a room that you could close the door on, where it's not gonna compromise your escape route. Never leave them charging unattended 
and never charge them overnight. A lot of the incidents we find have been brought about by mismatching of charges and batteries. All right, so just behave yourselves, charge safe. But what about the wacky waving dancing man? Well, I had a hypothesis for how they work, but I needed to see one up close. Hi, I'm Steve Mould, President and CEO of Wacky Waving Inflatable Arm Flailing Tube Man Emporium and Warehouse. Not really, we're at Megaflatables. Megaflatables for all your wacky waving flailing dancing arm man needs. So look, the way it works is you set the power of the fan to be not quite enough to keep the thing stiff with the end open. And so eventually the thing collapses because it's just fabric, right? But when it collapses, it creates a constriction in the hose. You can see it in the fold here. And so because the air can't escape as easily, you get a buildup of pressure. And that buildup of pressure is like blowing up a balloon. And so the fold moves upwards. And when the fold reaches the top, the end opens again. And so the air is able to flow freely and the pressure goes down. And now the pressure is once again, not high enough to keep the hose rigid. It collapses and the cycle continues. So it really feels like this is a different mechanism to the flailing fire hose or this flailing air hose of mine. Right, so I've been thinking about this firefighter reaction force thing and I think I know what's going on. So what we haven't been doing is thinking about it in terms of fluid dynamics. Specifically, we haven't been looking at it in terms of pressure. So the pressure is basically the same everywhere inside the hose. We know that because water travels through the hose at a constant speed. So if you think about a small parcel of water inside the hose, if it's moving at a constant speed, that must mean that there's no net force on it. And if there's no net force on it, it means the pressure must be the same all the way around that parcel of water. But what happens when you get to the end of the hose? Well, we know the pressure inside the hose is very high because you can see the walls of the hose straining against the pressure of the water. And we know that the pressure outside the hose is atmospheric pressure. So think about a parcel of water that's just leaving the hose. So on the inside, you've got that high pressure that's on the inside of the hose. On the outside, you've got low atmospheric pressure. So this parcel has a net force outwards. It's going to accelerate when it leaves the hose. It's going to gain some momentum at the nozzle. In other words, just like a rocket. So it was Newton's third law all along, but we need to be really specific about where Newton's third law is acting. This parcel of water that's leaving the nozzle is being pushed by the parcel of water that's just behind it. So it's this parcel of water just behind that feels the reaction force. And my first thought was, well, yes, but that parcel of water is just gonna push on the parcel of water behind it. And that parcel of water is gonna push on the parcel of water behind it all the way back to the pump. And so we're back to my reasoning. Except that's a bit like arguing that you could push on the end of a string and that force would travel all the way down to the other end of the string. So to be completely clear, I now believe that there are two separate reaction forces that we need to think about. There's the reaction force at the pump, and that accounts for the additional momentum that the water has as it's traveling through the hose. And then when the water leaves the hose, it gains some additional momentum because of that drop in pressure. And that leads to an additional reaction force that takes place at the nozzle. So the reaction force that the firefighter feels at the nozzle is due to the increased velocity of the water that happens at the nozzle. Not the full velocity of the water as it leaves, just the additional velocity. And potentially, additionally, as discussed, the hose might be pulling the firefighter back as well because of curves in the hose that are growing and causing it to snake more and more. Though interestingly, in the case of our air hose at least, the force that arises from the bends in the hose seem to be negligible compared to the reaction force of the nozzle due to the air receiving additional momentum when it escapes into that low pressure environment. We see that here in the apparent identical force on the end of the nozzle, regardless of how twisted up the hose is, but also in the fact that there's no flailing about in the hose when it's anchored at both ends, regardless of how much slack there is. If the air in those bends was applying a significant force to the hose, we should expect to see some wiggling. 
even when the ends are fixed, but we don't. The calculation could very well be quite different for water carrying hoses, because like, just off the top of my head, you know, air is much more compressible than water and that might have an effect. But it is quite telling that in this footage, it's only really the end of the hose that's flailing while well, the curves further down the hose don't seem to be growing like they would according to my original explanation. So perhaps my earlier description of hose instability should be modified. Like maybe the way we should be describing it is more like, you know, uh, some bend gets introduced like that. And so now the end of the hose is feeling a reaction force in this direction. So it travels in this direction like this. But of course, it can't keep going in that direction forever because it's, it's tethered here. So, you know, it gets only so far, but then it has to flip over like that because, you know, it, it's got momentum in that direction. It's going to keep going. But of course, you know, when, when the end of the hose changes direction like that, then that the, re the, the direction of the reaction force changes as well, right? So, um, you know, in, in a sort of a stepwise way, you've got this motion like that, you know, then it flips around, you know, and, and then the reaction force is pointing in the direction. And so then it comes back like this, right? And then it flips over and it comes back like this, but obviously it's smoother, you know, like that. Yeah. And actually, if there is this significant reaction force at the nozzle, then maybe sky dancers do have a little bit in common with fire hoses. Like, it seems quite apparent from this footage that the direction the top of the head is pointing is really significant. It looks as though there's a reaction force at the opening, and that's pushing the top of this sky dancer over in the other direction. So there's a bit more in common than I thought. I want to tell you about Jane Street's summer program. Jane Street is sponsoring this video. And I'll tell you straight away, the applications for the program close on the 12th of March. So you need to act fast on this one. Jane Street's Academy of Math and programming is open to recent high school graduates who are interested in maths and computer science. So if that's you, or it sounds like someone you know, then keep listening because well, for one thing, this program is completely free. In fact, Jane Street will give a $5,000 scholarship to every participant in the program towards their future educational opportunities. Jane Street is a trading firm, but you don't need any previous experience in finance, just an interest in maths and computer science. The curriculum program focuses on mathematics, computer programming, data analysis, game theory, and more. The program runs from the end of June to the start of August. But like I said before, applications close on the 12th of March. So if you're a recent high school graduate that's interested in maths and computer science, and you've also experienced barriers to advanced STEM educational opportunities, then this program might be for you. And hey, if you're a fan of Matt Parker, which I mean, you should be, then look, it's even more for you because he'll be showing up at some point during the program and getting involved. And I mean, if that doesn't persuade you, I don't know what will. The link to the application is in the description. So check out Jane Street's summer program today. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to hit subscribe. And the algorithm thinks you'll enjoy this video next.